are. Today is October 28th. I'm Gene Clobego. Raj uh, will be with us next week. He'll be back. And with us tonight, we have uh, Mr. Corella. And I think I think we're all set to go, Mr. Corella, if you are ready. So uh, with no further ado, why don't I take over? <laughs> okay. Um, first off, I just want to apologize for my voice or lack thereof uh, I have a, a cold and sore throat so oh dear. Um, I actually feel feel pretty good but I know that I don't sound very good so uh, I apologize for that um, I just when you asked me to present tonight I thought well um, I looked at what's going on and what has been going on um, from our office so I thought I would just give you a couple little highlights and I tried to choose some areas that might uh, appeal to um, different listeners uh, because you know everyone's from different disciplines and has uh, different things that they're wondering about. So um, if you'll humor me, I'll just jump around a little bit. First though, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about uh, technology because it really permeates all of our goals. And um, we have uh, been doing a lot of work both with the technology committee and within my office to uh, commit ourselves to embracing Office 365 this year uh, and to make sure that we integrate it into everything that we're doing. Our normal, our, our, our normal way of uh, doing business is changing a little bit um, so that you know, hopefully when we raise our profile with, with technology that um, other staff members will will do the same. So um, I wanted to review two things really quickly, and I'm sure that most people listening know this, but we currently have our um, curriculum maps, most of them, not all of them, are on New York Learns. Uh, so if anyone needs access to New York Learns, Gene, you're actually the guy to um, contact. Yes. I, and I have had a couple of new teachers contact me early this year. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you're looking for our current curriculum maps um, and you don't want to go all the way to New York Learns, you can get them from our district website. So um, when you're when you're logged in and you're looking at our homepage, um, if you look at the banner across the top, when you go to academics, um, open that up, go to curriculum, and then drill down to the individual grade level and you'll see on um, all of the curriculum maps for that grade level they are either direct links to maps that reside on New York Learns or in some cases their maps to uh, their links rather to our curriculum maps that we've done in uh, Word and one one of the reasons that we've been not doing or redoing um, all of our renewals with New York Learns is that we've been looking at um, other options for learning management systems. And we've been thinking about where eventually our curriculum maps might, might live. Uh, a lot of what we've seen uh, that has a lot of, that have a lot of powerful tools like um, Ray Gunnery talked about recently, uh, don't actually include curriculum repositories. So that's a little bit discouraging. So for the time being, we're, we're hanging on to New York Learns, but what we're trying to do is not um, put so many curriculum maps onto it that eventually when we need to take them out and migrate them somewhere else, it becomes a task that's, that's really difficult. But I just thought it would be pertinent to review where the, where the maps are. Um, so as, as I mentioned, it's really been a priority this year for my office to take a look at how we can encourage teachers to integrate technology. You all have been doing that for a long time. And um, when I look at my responsibilities for renewing curriculum and, and scheduling uh, professional development around updates and standards and, and, and so on, Unfortunately, especially the last, I would say, three years, uh, technology has kind of taken a back seat. We've looked at um, Office 365. I had some initial training 
the summer before last, and then I had some more this past summer. And um, it's been really um, difficult to get it going because, you know, we've always got so many competing topics that we have to present to our teachers in the little bit of time that we have to do so. So this year, we decided that starting this past summer, we were going to just throw ourselves into it as uh, an office staff. So we have um, all of our uh, curriculum uh, calendars on Office 365. We've uh, placed them into um, uh, OneNote. We also have our um, uh, uh, shared documents, our, our presentations, our vendor information, our superintendent's conference day schedules. We're building all of those things uh, within Office 365. And, and it's actually worked out tremendously well. Um, and I'm really excited about it. One of the things that I think I've learned is um, the best way to go about doing that from with me and my staff and I think with teachers in a, in a classroom is just um, throw yourselves in and, and just make a, uh, a, a, a commitment that you're going to do it no matter what, even if it's a little bit inconvenient. When I, when I first published my or shared my office calendar with the staff that I usually communicate with, like principals, coaches, um, and some other key staff within central office and out in the in the schools. Um, everyone couldn't get on and see it right away because everybody wasn't yet familiar with Office 365 or had just given it a really quick glance. So it was really uh, tempting to say, okay, well, I'll just go back and start using Publisher again, which is what I was accustomed to using. But um, we kind of stuck with it. Everybody found what they needed to to find, and um, and it's and it's working really well. There are a lot of advantages to it. Um, one of them is that I'm I'm able to build my office calendar with all of the professional development and meetings and um, uh, curriculum groups uh, right out till June, and I I continually add to it. So. All the staff that I work with can continually check it. And also principals who want to schedule things in their own buildings can see several months out what we've got scheduled, including Saturday professional development. Uh, we've got all the DAP uh, meetings that are scheduled in, in that calendar. So you can really take a look and know that if you want to add your own school initiatives, you can see what you might want to consider scheduling around. So it's really made everything pretty pretty transparent for us. So uh, on to a couple of other things. Um, that's what we're doing as an office. And then we um, wanted to make sure that as we did our professional development and as we supported schools with their school improvement plans and our district's um, comprehensive education plan or our DSIP, that we make sure technology was integrated in uh, into everything. I know you heard uh, Ray talk about our visit to the ISTE conference in Chicago this past June. It was certainly um, an eye opener. And, and one of the things that I learned when I was there was some new vocabulary that helped me um, form some uh, or formulate some uh, key terms for some things that I've been thinking and observing about technology use. One of the things that they uh, kept coming back to was um, consumption of technology versus integration of technology. And what, what they mean by consumption is using devices for lower level skills or with lower level activities such as uh, practice or remediation which certainly has its place, but oftentimes in a lot of classrooms, we don't get beyond that. And we're really not using technology uh, fully integrated with learning. So kids are uh, problem solving and using it creatively, um, producing products and really constructing meaning and um, products that they can share out. Uh, so that, that's really what we wanna be doing. Purposeful practice is really important, uh, and it certainly has its has its place. But we want to keep moving forward. 
So one of the ways that we are doing that is we're going to be very soon hiring uh, a district technology integrator. Again, I keep referring back uh, to Ray's presentation. I was on the webinar that, that Sunday night and he talked a little bit uh, about it. And um, it was something that we had really uh, wanted to do for a long time. And we were fortunate this year to, as part of our comprehensive uh, Title I federal education grant, we were allotted some Title IV funding. Uh, we hadn't received any for quite a few years. And, and Title IV has three main parts. Um, one part has to do with safe and healthy students. Another part has to do with um, uh, uh, enriched activities and uh, uh, challenging curriculum and other supports for students. And then another portion of it is technology. And we were, uh, of course, had, we, we had to make a plan in order to put everything together into our uh, Title I uh, application. And we had been thinking about uh, some different ways to, to structure it. Then when the guidance came out from the State Education Department that basically tells us um, what is allowable and what is not allowable as far as um, spending those grant funds and formulating goals, it was really apparent that what they are nudging school districts to do is look beyond the number of devices that we have and the um, amount or variety of software that we own and that we use with kids to go beyond it into really how are kids using technology? How are they creating with it? Um, and, and how is it a seamless part of every lesson and unit, or at least many lessons and uh, units? So to our surprise, we were um, not allowed to buy devices with, with this grant funding. We were not allowed to buy software. And so really what, what, what it came down to was um, we were being encouraged to set funds aside to have either uh, knowing others in the form of a, of a tech integrator or you know, a person, a coach, if you will, uh, and or provide specific targeted funding for professional development outside of the school day where teachers could learn um, uh, new uh, aspects of technology that they could turn right around to their classroom. So um, we're, we're very, very excited about that. And that will be coming uh, very soon. Um, backtracking a little bit, um, I think you could Gene, go to our first slide here. And um, again, staying with technology, what, what we did this summer was um, we began to look at uh, the technology tools that we had currently in the, in the district. And one of them that was used uh, by all teachers K to eight was um, something called Tech Steps. We uh, selected Tech Steps uh, back in 2015 with a large committee of teachers. And at the time, it appealed to us because uh, it, rather than being a, um, a software program that um, teachers had to have a great deal of um, technology knowledge in order to use and that they had to create their own units or lessons with, this was actually a curriculum-based product that had embedded projects where technology was already woven in. Um, it, was, it was fairly easy to use, and uh, it had multiple libraries that we could choose from. So, for example, second grade had an English language arts project that we embedded in the curriculum, and they had a math project that we embedded in the, in the curriculum. Um, other uh, grade levels had a science project and an English language arts product or a social studies project and an English language arts project. So uh, that worked well for a few years, but um, it, what we noticed is that it was not being used as much as it could be. Uh, teachers were asking to use other applications or um, as they were learning more about the technology that, 
that uh, we had. They wanted to branch out and do different things. And then, you know, in the practical sense, the software is very costly. So we decided to um, not renew our license and to kind of fly without a net for a little bit, so to speak. Uh, we, what we did was we created um, a scope and sequence of technology skills, just starting with the elementary level. Uh, our initial document is just grades kindergarten through uh, six. Um, Ed Ventry, who works in my office, and Dave St. Ange, who uh, is um, a dean at Hyde Park, uh, and is also currently doing his administrative internship um, central office experience with me. Uh, he began in the spring and he's going to be finishing up in a few weeks. Dave and Ed took the lead and uh, they worked with some teachers this summer to create this scope and sequence based on one that Ray and I found when we were at the SD conference. Um, so our, our purpose really was to make it very clear grade by grade what skills we should be introducing to students or maintaining uh, or mastering at, at certain grade levels. I say it's kind of like flying without a net because the onus is on the teacher to wrap those skills into lessons and units. So uh, while it gives uh, our, in, our teachers a lot more choice and flexibility, um, it does give them some more responsibility as uh, well. And so I know that as we go throughout this year and next, we're going to have to target a lot of our professional development around um, some of the tools that we already have in, in our existing curricula and how we can meet these skills through them. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the upcoming Elementary Professional Development Day where we're where we're seeking to do quite a bit of that. So um, within the next week, you're going to see this document um, posted on the district website under each grade level curriculum tab. It's the same document, uh, but of course it, it, it'll have to be posted for each, each grade level. And it um, starts with, um, a little bit of an introduction, and then there's a key, and, and the key is here at, at, at the bottom of this uh, slide right here. Um, uh, simply put, uh, uh, an I stands for uh, a skill that's introduced. Uh, uh, M means uh, met, or it should be mastered by that particular grade level. And um, C, or uh, completed, and in uh, this case, we didn't use a C, but actually a shaded box means that those are tasks that kids have had experience with and may have mastered, but they really are going to need to be uh, maintained. So if you go to the next slide, Jean, it, it shows a little snip. Literally, I just took a, a, a snip out of um, one of the uh, pages of the document. And somehow I managed to cut off the category and the grade levels. But if you look very hard, you can see it goes from K to six. And uh, this first one is uh, technology operations and, and, and concepts. So uh, these are some very basic uh, concepts. And you can see that they um, are introduced in kindergarten. And most of them are met by first grade, uh, second, uh, and then if you get down to uh, learn to use special characters, then that's not introduced until second grade and then hopefully mastered in third grade. The document itself has has several categories. Again, this this comes these are all based on the ISTE standards. We didn't we didn't create any of this um, in any any of these categories. They're certainly not uh, original. We we wanted them to be aligned. Um, uh, there's technology and, uh, operations and concepts, uh, problem solving and computational thinking, uh, research and informational fluency, creativity and innovation, digital citizenship, and communication and uh, collaboration. So uh, we introduced this 
to a few of our grade levels at our first Superintendents Conference Day professional development on the 13th of September. And uh, more of our staff will be seeing it at the elementary level in the upcoming professional development day. Uh, and again, as I said, it's going to be posted. So um, we are going to continually come back to this and, and, and use it as our, um, as, our, as our guiding document. So um, another couple of examples of, of how we're trying to be fluid with technology from the curriculum and, and instruction standpoint is um, we have uh, been using Teams quite a bit, which I know you've, you've talked a lot about on these uh, webinars. And um, we have several uh, office teams, but um, starting this, this week, for example, the uh, primary NISLIS committee is going to begin to work with me and, and Ronnie McGrath on uh, Tuesdays uh, after school to um, work on revising and ramping up our current uh, curricula for grades K1 and 2 science. Um, as, as most of you know, the state has uh, adopted new science standards. Um, we call them for short the NISLA standards, the New York State Science Learning Standards. They're heavily based on the next generation science standards, but there are some, some differences. Um, they're, they're very different in approach. Uh, they're very much aligned with what we have been moving toward in our STEM initiative, where we uh, present kids with phenomenon and they uh, use the inquiry model to figure out what is, what is happening. Um, and then only after kids have gone through that phase do we begin to introduce content and vocabulary. So the instructional sequence is flipped a little bit uh, from what um, a lot of us are uh, used to. Um, an interesting thing, and I know I, I've talked about this at, uh, in several different venues before, is that the um, State Education Department is rolling out the science standards very, very slowly. Um, we began with just the K-2 standards. There was um, a, first the awareness year, which was last year, where we did uh, professional development around the standards. And then uh, this year is, uh, nor is called the, um, not the implementation year, but the um, preparation or capacity building year. So this is the year where we take a look at our curricula and resources and we roll up our sleeves and make sure that we are aligned. And then we will, um, in the 2019-2020 school year, we'll implement uh, the K-2 to two science standards 100% uh, within our district. Uh, now this year is the um, awareness year for grades three through five. So I have a couple of teachers along with Ronnie McGrath that are attending um, the deep curriculum alignment workshops that you may have seen advertised through Erie One BOCES. Um, we just have two teachers and Ronnie attending because they are during the day and we know that it's difficult to release teachers uh, via substitute. So uh, Jerry Prezzuti from 79th Street and Dan Weiss from Niagara Street are our intermediate reps and they um, are going along with Ronnie to uh, gather all of the information and in the initial training uh, and then we'll start to turn key it uh, to our grades three through uh, five teachers. So having given you the, the background then, to uh, start the work this year with uh, K-2, to really, which is the, the final leg, we're going to be um, piloting three different sets of resources, as well as uh, beginning work on an aligned framework uh, for the new standards. We uh, know that we want to align them with um, our current language arts curriculum, uh, and uh, we need to look for more opportunities to um, integrate because there are 
is not a lot of um, discretionary time within the school day to address the science standards. So we're working on uh, the curriculum, piloting resources, and we're also looking at um, assessments. We're looking at possibly um, different kinds of performance uh, assessments that we might build into a student portfolio. Uh, we're, we're having very um, initial conversations. We started this summer and we're continuing on throughout the school year. But I, the interesting thing is that normally to prepare for such work, I would have created a binder with um, all kinds of paper documents. Uh, we, we have district um, uh, documents that we always review at the beginning of every curriculum renewal, uh, our belief statements, our processes, our task lists, our uh, rubric for selection of materials, and all of that would have been put into a binder. But instead, um, we created a, a team in Microsoft Office, and we are just uploading all of the documents, uh, our rubric, our agenda, for our uh, first meeting, and everything is, is um, loaded. So all our teachers need to do on Tuesday is bring their laptops. So um, we're, you know, Obviously, we're trying to lead by example here and, uh, and, and uh, really sh um, show everyone what we can accomplish with, with Office 365. So we're uh, really excited about that. Um, another thing that um, we're doing with the Professional Development Day that is, is coming up is we purposely looked at two district initiatives to see how we could marry, marry them with technology. Um, so first, um, I know Mr. Laurie has talked quite a bit about uh, differentiated in, uh, instruction and how important that is to moving students forward. So that is one theme and one initiative that we can absolutely accomplish with the help of technology. And then uh, the other initiative, uh, are, initiatives are um, uh, instructional strategies that we have identified as key to moving forward and that most of our um, schools have built into their school comprehensive education plans like such as learning targets, um, student engagement strategies, checking for understanding and, and informative assessment. So if those form the big umbrella Technology is one tool under that umbrella that, that um, we can really use. So just, just a sample of how we focus, with that focus, we created our uh, agenda for the upcoming Professional Development Day. Our kindergarten teachers are going to be working with Roger, and they are going to get uh, an introduction to Office 365, and then they're going to create a kindergarten math team. Uh, and what is really cool about this is this idea came from them. They um, had quite a bit of curriculum and other new initiatives that they needed to um, go over on the first professional development day. So they didn't have an opportunity to get their feet wet, uh, wet with Office 365. So they asked if they could do so on this uh, upcoming day. And would they be able to do more work around their kindergarten math curriculum. So they've been doing um, uh, quite a bit of work with uh, fluency. So they're going to create a, a team and they're going to share uh, fluency activities. Grades one and two are going to be working on differentiated instruction with uh, some different tools that we have, in particular, uh, what we have available to us through the Think Central platform. Uh, grades three and four are going to be working on formative assessment in mathematics with some different apps that um, we have available to us, um, a lot of which are in the, in the um, public domain, but that can really help teachers um, and save them a lot of time while getting them a lot of uh, student information. And um, sixth, uh, fifth, sixth, and um, uh, uh, fifth and sixth grade, of course, their uh, fifth grade is, is going to continue their implementation of uh, journeys, and they're going to be looking at several different things. But sixth grade, we have a totally digital curriculum 
this, that we implemented this year. It's called Amplify ELA. And we uh, selected it for grades six, seven, and eight. So it was, um, it's a bold step. And honestly, I have to be frank, one that uh, uh, surprised me a little bit. I, I love the program, uh, but I was a little surprised that, our, that the majority of our teachers wanted to dive in and implement it, simply because it's, it's, it's so new and so different. Um, and the implementation is, is going really, really well. Um, one of the terrific things about this totally digital platform is that it has differentiation built in. The teacher can select different levels of, a, of the same assignment that a student will then complete after some whole class instruction. And one of the things, particularly at grade seven and eight, that's a huge challenge for us is when we have over 100 students, how do we effectively differentiate when we have that many kids who have a wide variety of needs and, and we have students with disabilities in that mix and we have English lang uh, uh, language learners in that mix. So, you know, how do we do that effectively? Um, and the this digital uh, program has tons of support in it that um, that is really very exciting. So um, that's just a little bit about uh, how we're trying to kind of take our district initiatives uh, and our technology initiatives and, and put them together. So at this point, I think, are there, are there any questions? Uh, uh, there is one question. Uh, will any parts of the district technology scope and sequence be appearing on student report cards in the future? Well, that's a really interesting um, question. I don't know the answer to that. We what we always revise our report cards along with um, large groups of uh, teachers and other stakeholders. So um, it wouldn't be something I would just uh, you know willy nilly say would need to go on a on a report card. But I I really think that is a fabulous idea for a couple of reasons. One of them. Um, is that it makes it plain to parents um, what we're working with kids on in school and you know they can see the connection uh, with maybe what they're doing with kids at home and the uh, and the different um, tools that they allow their kids to use on either their phones or on their on their iPads or personal uh, computers and uh, also uh, that would mean that that student data or and you know the the information on mastery of those skills would be in our um, student management system it it would be in power school and we could uh, actually create reports that we could use for different purposes um, we could use that information to write for grants we could use that information to uh, you know when we're um, renewing curricula and not only choosing products, but as we're working on units of study and writing lessons. And also, we um, in the past have always been asked to, on beds day, report the um, number of students we feel entered high school uh, technology literate. And, and that's been very difficult to do without a central universal system. Uh, so I love the idea of somehow weaving um, a measure, you know, a, a, or even a, a modest measure of how kids are progressing with their technology skills into our um, report cards, because then we could pull that data for a lot of different um, purposes. Great. That's a that's a that's a great idea. And if I may just say, if anybody else has any questions, they can go to the little question box in your uh, uh, window there and send them along, and we'll get them to you, to uh, Mr. Corella, when the uh, you know whenever we can do that. Okay. The uh, next slide. Um, I just wanted to spend the the rest of the time giving you a, a few updates about. Um, some uh, 
new standards and uh, curriculum initiatives that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, this is, is a newer one, the, the computer science and digital literacy uh, standards that the state is uh, putting together. Um, this shows the timeline that they used. There was a, um, a survey that was given in the spring of 2017. Um, and uh, now the standards are being drafted currently. Um, but in this, this, this past May, um, the uh, Educational Technology Advisory Committee made recommendations for what they thought those standards should be uh, categorically, uh, at, at least. And um, in, um, help me know what I, uh, I put, uh, that's a, a typographical error there. It should be spring of um, 2019. The standards will be reviewed and th there will be a public comment period. Um, and then in the fall of 2019, after um, any revisions have been done based on public comment, um, there should be a set of computer science and digital literacy standards adopted by the Board of Regents. Um, what, they're, what they're currently grappling with from the information that I've received is um, they are, they're, they're not sure if digital literacy and computer science should be separate disciplines or two strands of the of the same discipline and so that kind of goes to the to the next bullet point they're looking at you know knowledge and skills and thinking what is important for all kids versus what is only important for kids who plan to work in the field of computer science so um i thought that that was um very very interesting and i i wonder how that will uh these standards will affect what what we're currently exposing our uh, students to. <laughs> the uh, next one is uh, is um, very interesting as well. It has to do with um, uh, physical education. So you might have heard, um, Gina, this is the uh, next slide here. No, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, this, this one has to do with um, phys ed. Um, the phys ed standards have not been revised in a very long time. So uh, this past spring, um, NYSED formed a review team and they defined their goals and objectives. They began some initial meetings with this central group this summer. And currently they're working on, on reviewing and revising the K-12 PE standards. Mm -hmm. Um, what if they stick to this timeline um, by this by the latest the spring there should be um, some draft standards for public review and uh, comment and then uh, over the summer and fall the the public um, comment will continue then uh, next school year the 1920 school year they're hoping to have a final draft for uh, uh, Board of Regents approval and then uh, statewide public comment. Um, so probably we're looking at, you know, the winter spring of 2020 before that yeah, all concludes and we have new standards and then probably not until the summer of 2020 will we see some um, initial guidance that uh, addresses these, these new standards. And if you take a look at the next slide, uh, there are a few um, there are a few in interesting things here uh, that relate to what they're currently looking at. Um, there have been a couple of sets of national standards or benchmarks that have been put out since the early 2000s, and um, New York has chosen to base their um, new standards heavily on the SHAPE standards, uh, the national standards from the Society of Health and uh, Physical Education. And those are, you know, physical literacy concepts and principles around movement and performance, um, knowledge and skills that uh, are on maintaining acceptable levels of uh, physical activity, fitness, um, 
responsibility for personal health um, that respects self and others, and then um, recognizing the value and benefits of, of, of physical activities. Then um, these, these last two possible standard areas are very intriguing to me. Um, the first one is acquisition of resources to achieve and maintain physical, social, and emotional wellness. Um, so that's basically self-advocacy for one's own health. Um, and then uh, uh, becoming informed consumers um, with knowledge and skills for careers in phys ed, health, and wellness. Uh, kind of a, a tangent to this is um, in, the, in the spring, the um, uh, State Education Department put out some uh, mental health education uh, mandates. And basically what they're saying is, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, districts need to be sure that we have a, a, a cohesive program where we teach kids about uh, mental health and raise their awareness of how to <coughs> monitor one's own mental health, what's what is normal, what is what is acceptable, um, uh, how to um, uh, advocate for oneself and, and, and who, especially for young kids, um, who is who is available to help them as well as what are some strategies to uh, deal with uh, stress. Um, currently, it's really not mandated. Health education isn't mandated except for at the, at the secondary level. But now we have to have a, a comprehensive K to 12 um, platform. And uh, I, I, I would say patchwork of different programming. Um, at the elementary grades, it can be as simple as um, utilizing some of the um, outside agency programs that we currently have like uh, BEST um, that, you know, that teach kids strategies for um, maintaining good uh, mental health but um, we really need to do to do more with that and one of the discussions that we've had is um, you know how comfortable are teachers doing this how well can um, are how well prepared are they and you know what do we as districts need to do to make sure that we have robust programming and that our staff is comfortable dealing with these issues and, and we, we keep coming back to um, the role of the physical education teacher. And though it's not currently in the current standards, it seems like a very logical fit for certain units in the phys ed classroom um, where we can stress the connection between a healthy body and a healthy mind. Uh, and, and so we've, we've been talking quite a bit about um, how we can involve our physical education teachers in um, advising us and, and getting this uh, information uh, to kids. And when I was looking at one of the uh, Regents reports recently and saw this bit of information, I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's very interesting that they're starting to, I, I, it looks to me like the state education department is thinking along the same lines. And that's, and that's really exciting. Okay, I see we only have about 10 or so minutes left. So I think we just have a couple slides. Uh, if we go to the next one, uh, a quick update on the arts, something that we also don't get to talk about enough. Um, the new art standards for New York State were uh, adopted in September of 2017. And then through last all of last year, there were turnkey trainings offered uh, throughout the state, and um, the 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 standards themselves are uh, have been very well received from the professionals that I've talked to, uh, in particular our own um, art and music teachers. Um, the 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 one uh, criticism I would have is that the state education department um, has given us a very quick timeline to roll them out. So we really have not met the timeline, and I don't know most districts that have. They, um, 
basically just dropped the standards in 2017 and said that we needed to fully implement them in September of 2018. Uh, and that's really not, not doable for a couple of reasons. One of, one of which was um, the state education department wanted us to make sure that our initial training and overview was provided by a, a, a person or a facilitator who had been trained by the state education department. And um, there were, there was supposed to be a cadre of people that were going to fan out across the state and do that. Um, and there were some issues. And so the training wasn't as readily as uh, accessible as we, as we had hoped. So we've, we've come up with our timeline. Uh, the good thing is that the arts police are not coming into our district uh, and anytime soon. And they're, and they're not going to slap our hands for, um, for being a little bit behind. But um, what, so, so what we did uh, is we took a look at what the um, state has made available to us. Um, they have provided some uh, professional development materials. They've also given us some guidance on assessments um, and uh, some possible ways that we might want to think about having uh, high school kids demonstrate their proficiency in the arts. Um, and then we've taken that uh, information and the first thing that we did locally here was on our uh, opening superintendents conference day on September 13th, um, I had all of the art um, and music teachers together and they were trained uh, by a certified trainer who now works for Erie One Bosis. His name is Jim uh, Daly. And um, interestingly, he is actually a part of the technology department. He was a graphic artist uh, and a digital artist uh, by, by trade before he joined uh, BOCES and, um, and began working with uh, teachers. Um, one of the interesting things that he told me is that he thinks our district is in a very good position because we do have curriculum maps for our uh, arts and uh, music courses where a lot of districts really don't, which was a little bit uh, surprising to me. But Jim worked with our teachers for a full day on the uh, 13th. And then uh, throughout this year, he'll be back with us four more times um, to work with different groups on uh, different days. And what we've decided to do was, is to take that work and just select one unit uh, and realign that unit. You know, something that our teachers feel is valuable um, and that's kind of timeless and rework it to match the new standards. So um, on November 6th, um, we have two of our art teachers that are going to be leading the elementary department in uh, reworking one of their units. Uh, and we'll be working with the high school in uh, the winter and the prep school in the spring. Then by the summer of 2019, we're going to look at a uh, full-scale curriculum revision. I'm not sure at this point if it's going to involve every grade level and every course um, or, or how that is, how that's going uh, to look. I'm sure it will include K to eight and we'll have to be a little more strategic with the high school um, because the high school has a lot of different courses and they're, they're developed all of the time. Uh, and not all of them at this point are sufficiently mapped. So um, we're gonna have our uh, work cut out for, the, for us there, but, but that's what's happening with uh, the arts. And I have a quick, I have two more quick updates for you on the ELA and math standards and on the CTE standards. And then that should bring us right to the end of the hour. And I'm, I know it's going to bring me right to the end of my <laughs> voice. There isn't, there isn't too much left here. Um, this, this timeline has, has not changed for the next generation ELA and, and math standards. Um, it is a, uh, it can be a pretty scary thing to look at it the way that it's laid out here. But um, the good thing here is that um, the standards are based on the common core standards. They're heavily based on the common core standards, which 
means that they're not greatly different from the current standards uh, standards that um, that that we have. There, um, a lot of the revisions that have been made were more along the lines of clarification, uh, embellishment, uh, rewording, and there was a special emphasis put on creating um, supplementary uh, explanatory documents to go along with the standards. There are introductions, there uh, are English language arts reading and writing briefs, which uh, talk about the philosophy behind the standards and kind of give the umbrella under which the standards live philosophically. So um, having said that, we, we still have quite a bit of work to do before we get to full implementation. You can see here on this slide, full implementation is September 2020. So to back up, um, we're still technically in the awareness phase but at some point during this year, we need to move to the uh, capacity building stage where we begin to roll out more uh, professional development and begin planning how we're going to align our um, uh, curriculum maps um, and uh, resources, which I, I don't see as, as, as a huge job. Um, but we're really not going to know until we create our um, our, our full plan. Uh, right now, state ed is going to continue the um, three through eight assessments being based on the 2010-11 uh, standards. And they're going to continue to um, have those uh, assessments be two days in duration, uh, untimed. Those are, are, are some of the changes that were made within the last year that I think most people are uh, aware of. Now, new assessments that will be aligned to the new standards won't uh, debut until the spring of 2021. And then for um, high school, um, the, uh, they're just projecting right now that um, the 2021 school year may be when the Regents is realigned. But that is a little squishy at this point. I can't think of a better way to say it. Than that. <laughs> and so I think this next slide, Gene, I think I really already already talked about it. But uh, one of the things that uh, the uh, state, like I said, ha has put out a lot of helpful documents that are uh, if separate from the standards themselves, but are, are meant to work uh, along with the, with the standards. And one of them is um, what they call the roadmap. So it's a nice uh, framework uh, and a step-by-step -step plan for um, bringing our, our teachers up, uh, uh, up to capacity and ready to uh, implement. So during the, this spring, I'll be working with our district instructional coaches to create our own district map. Uh, and make sure that everything is scheduled out appropriately. And so we know when we head into our summer training season and our 2018-19 uh, uh, professional development calendar building, we know what we need to do and we can give this uh, initiative priority because this, this is going to start to come to the surface as something that we, that we need to um, uh, put first and foremost. And so finally, the last slide here um, has to do with something that just came out, which I'm really excited about. And that is um, the CTE, or Career Technical Ed um, modules. Uh, you've, uh, you've heard Mr. Laurie speak uh, very passionately about his desire to have uh, vocational training uh, back within the city limits and to develop some district programming that augments what um, our students can access at Orleans and Agribosis. And uh, to that end, uh, about a year, uh, maybe a little more than a year ago, the State Education Department began to look at career and technical education and um, in particular where, where it begins in earnest at the middle level. And they uh, gave districts 
some new flexibility, uh, which is, is really important in implementing these standards. It, it, it's driven by a couple things. Um, it, it, it's driven by uh, an acknowledgement that our current curricula for courses like family consumer science and um, in some cases technology, but not in, not in all cases, um, is becoming somewhat obsolete. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it might not be as aligned as it could be with the current job market. Um, and also, uh, there is a definite shortage of teachers that are certified in CTE areas. And so when you take a look at the, at the blue font here on this slide, there's uh, agriculture, business, family and consumer science, health sciences, tech education, and trade and technical education. So typically what we've had is just a family consumer science course, which was uh, three quarters of a, of a credit and the uh, um, half a credit of, uh, or the, uh, a full credit rather of uh, eighth grade technology. So um, what, the, what the state ed has done for us is they've given us flexibility um, as far as how we plan those courses locally. So we have the freedom now to um, reimagine those courses in ways that are responsive to the interests of students, um, the particular um, characteristics of the community, as well as the teachers that we currently have that work for us. So we can have those courses, if they're um, constructed properly, be taught by a variety of CTE certified people, not just technology certified teachers and ju not just family and uh, consumer science teachers. So we uh, have some uh, options and uh, of, of what that blended, of what those blended courses could, could look like. When, the, when these um, amended regulations came out, we were told that um, the state was working on um, uh, modules that would give us some exemplar units to look at and so we've been waiting for them to come out and they were just released this month so uh, there are two kinds there are theme modules and there are content modules content modules are really the um, hardcore uh, cte modules that need to be taught by a teacher that's certified in that area and the theme modules are more uh, generic and they have, and they touch a variety of different subjects. So, um, and they can be taught by um, uh, someone who has a CTE cert, but um, they're more uh, they're more of a of a generalist uh, approach. So, what what we've done in our district so far is uh, this past summer, we worked with some family consumer science, technology, and math and uh, science teachers at the middle level, and we reworked one unit for each course with a STEM focus. Uh, and then in the spring semester, we're going to be um, seating a, a, a group of um, teachers uh, in a, for lack of a better term, a curriculum revision committee that's gonna start to look at model units and what programming is available locally um, talk to community partners and, um, you know, consider the superintendent's vision for vocational ed and uh, start to build a framework that we'll then finish over this summer. So it should culminate in the revision of our grade seven family consumer science course and our grade eight uh, technology course. So um, talk about going down to the wire. I see <laughs> You have a minute yet. Uh, uh, there is one question. If you have, okay. if, if you have, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me see if I can read it properly. Will any of the revi revisions to physical education standards affect how students qualify for OT or PT or our occupational therapy and physical therapy qualification based only on impacts to academics? 
Uh, that that I don't have an answer to. Okay. Yeah, I re- I really don't. That's a a very good question, but it, it's it's not something I, I'm really qualified yeah. to answer. Okay. Well, I. Uh... Okay, and well, we uh, thank want to thank you very, very much for uh, being uh, with us. What we'll do is we will uh, put the uh, video and this uh, PowerPoint up for those uh, teachers who want to view or uh, take a look at it again. And I want to thank everybody for being here. And Mr. Krell, I certainly hope your voice uh, and you feel better soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, and thank you, and if there are no other problems, well, thanks for being with us. We hope to see you next week, and uh, have a good week, everybody. Good night.